country occupied by the armed forces of Nazi Germany, divided by the barbed wire of concentration camps, governed by Nazi decrees, watched by the Gestapo, a sullen, mournful country. But over the night air between Holland and England flash the signals of a different Holland, invisible to the Nazis, but menacing their hold on the country, the Holland of the fighting underground. Tonight, the RAF will raid a railroad yard through which the Nazis are to route a troop train bound for the coast. In that raid, Peter van Dongen, an ordinary Dutch citizen, will play his part. In those minutes of anxious waiting, Peter van Dongen thinks of the Holland that was, the new Holland that he hopes will be. He recalls the symbols which to the whole world typify Holland. Windmills, tulips, wooden shoes, the old lowland country of peaceful farms and fields fragrant with the salt tang of the sea winds, the fishing villages and brown sailed boats. The old buildings whose distinctive roof lines have reappeared in all parts of the world. The historic Holland of the great artists Vermeer and Rembrandt. But Peter van Dongen recalls also a less familiar Holland. The new Holland with its great ocean liners and industrial cities. Where modern design is the mainspring of the life of the working man. Applied to his homes, his roads, his transportation. This is a Holland connected with the four corners of the earth, not only by ocean liner, but by airliner. Peter van Dungen remembers that his country, in more than 100 years of peace with its European neighbors, had faced war of a different kind. Across their low-lying coastal fields, the Dutch fought with scientific cunning against the encroachments of their traditional enemy, the sea. Where once dashed the dark waves of the North Sea, now ripple the golden waves of wheat. But this little country, with its eight million inhabitants, was the head of a distant southern empire of 67 million people. The Netherlands East Indies stretched over a vast area, rich in oil, tin, rubber, and other prized natural products. Peter van Dungen remembers that his country had developed the resources of the Indies under a rule based rather on stewardship than on ownership. He remembers, too, the enormous numbers of native peoples in the Indies. In Java, there are 800 inhabitants to the square mile. In Canada, only three. Here, the Dutch revived ancient craft instituted scientific training. Under an educational system which preserved the native customs and arts, they introduced the Indonesians to the best aspects of Western civilization. In the shadow of Javanese temples sprang up busy, thriving cities. Halfway around the world lie the Dutch West Indies, Dutch Guiana or Suriname on the mainland of South America and islands of the Caribbean. In these colonies, too, a Netherlands administration safeguarded the welfare of the native peoples. And throughout the empire, the mother country remained as a perpetual symbol of goodwill and peace. September 1939, the peaceful people of Holland read the dreaded headlines, War. Until the last minute, the government, adopting a position of armed neutrality, refused to allow even military discussion with the French and British staffs, thus hoping that the German fury would spend itself elsewhere. But in the darkness of early morning, May 10th, 1940, a century of Dutch peace came to a brutal end. Dutch 
conditioned by centuries of looking out across the horizons of their flat fields, resorted to their classic defense. They opened the dikes and flooded whole sections of their rich country in the path of the onrushing Germans. But against this horizontal defense, the Germans threw a vertical attack. Their parachute battalions vaulted the water barrier and descending from above, slashed across the Dutch armies from the west. Outmaneuvered and outnumbered, the Dutch army was forced to capitulate. And even as the Dutch signed the papers of submission, the Germans committed one of the most unwarranted acts of military brutality in history. They bombed the city of Rotterdam to smoking ruins. With the center of government firmly established in England, no time was lost in continuing the fight. In the Indies, the small army was reinforced with men and equipment. The Indonesians and the Dutch, working in a unity born of many years of living together under a common rule. There was much to fight with, much to fight for. The products of the Indies were urgently needed. Tea, rice, and sago food staples of immense value. Quinine, exclusive product of the Indies. Rubber and tin, of which the islands were among the heaviest producers in the world. And on all these riches, Germany's Axis partner, Japan, had been casting an envious and probing eye. To the Indies came Japanese diplomats to negotiate trade treaties, unsuccessful missions which served as a front to mask war plans already completed down to the last detail. Over spy radio transmitters went innocent messages, weather good, convolvulus and hibiscus in bloom. Later translated, Dutch cruisers and destroyers anchored at Batavia. That was the day before Pearl Harbor. Before even the United States, the Netherlands government declared war on Japan. Cooperating with the Dutch, the Indonesians continued to improve the limited defenses of the islands, working in industries new to them with skill and patience. Navy and Army aeroplanes, manned by Dutch and Indonesians, struck at Japanese shipping of the China Seas as the Japanese moved swiftly south to capture Malaya. And against vastly superior odds, the Royal Dutch Navy steamed out from Indies ports on what proved to be a gallant but suicidal attempt to stop the Japanese thrust towards Singapore. Japanese, profiting by their lightning advance, were soon in a position to bomb Sumatra and Java. But the small Dutch air force, depleted by its work in Allied waters, was no longer able to defend the islands effectively. Early months of 1942, the Japanese landed and drove back the well-equipped but small Indies army in a series of savage attacks. Large-scale resistance elapsed, but the scattered Indies army withdrew to carry on their tenacious fight in the jungles and mountains, where some are still fighting even today. To the conquerors was left the scorched earth of wrecked machinery smoking plantations and flaming oil wells. In this hour of defeat, the Netherlands government in exile met to plan how best the Dutch kingdom could keep on fighting. To Canada were sent remnants of the Netherlands army from all over the world to train in the latest assault tactics, 
and later to take their place in the armies standing ready for the attack on Hitler's Europe. In the United States, the Royal Netherlands Air Force trained Dutch pilots for bomber and fighter squadrons destined for the South Pacific fronts. Weaving a new global pattern in the life of their empire, Indonesian soldiers were sent 10,000 miles westward across the world to Dutch Guiana and Curaçao, now of high economic consequence in the defenses of the Western Hemisphere. The vast bauxite deposits of Dutch Guiana were vital to the enormous aluminum industry of Canada and the United States, and hence to North American aircraft production. Dutch Guiana, an economic liability from the beginning of its history, now became an asset. Over 500 miles away along the northern coast of South America are the great oil refineries of Curaçao and Aruba, the largest in the Western world. There is processed the high-test aviation fuel urgently needed by the United Nations to replace the oil of the East Indies, now within Japan's puppet empire. Today, from the Diet in Tokyo, the honeyed words of Japanese friendship and goodwill pour out over the crowded countries of the Eastern world, countries where all too long the Western empires had insufficiently realized their responsibilities of government. And to peoples long resentful of the partially fulfilled promises of the West, the Japanese make alluring offers of wealth and security and toast the independence they have cynically granted to their Eastern partners. Today, the Western powers face the necessity of a political program molded to the wishes of the people of their former empires. And already, Queen Wilhelmina has declared the Netherlands' readiness to work together in a commonwealth of purpose with the peoples of the Indies. And to the armed might of Japan, the Netherlands oppose a renewed resistance geared to the United Nations strategy in the vast Pacific theater of war. Dutch and American airmen are smashing at Japanese invasion bases with increasing ferocity as the reconquest of the Indies gets underway. Towards the outlying islands are pushing the landing barges of the Allied armies, slashing at the Japanese octopus from the south, as is China from the west and the United States from the north. The tide of battle has turned. Tonight, in lonely danger, Peter van Dongen flashes to the skies the welcome of the fighting Dutch. Tomorrow, with the men of other fighting nations, he will play a vital part in building a new world commonwealth of free and equal men.